The number of kids diagnosed with gender dysphoria has surged in recent years. In America, diagnoses have almost tripled from about 15,000 to more than 42,000 between 2017 to 2021. In the United Kingdom, the number of minors referred to the National Gender Identity Development Service grew from 51 in 2009 to 1,766 by 2016, leading to years-long wait lists for care within the government-run health system. That surge caused England's National Health Service to commission an extensive study of youth gender treatment. That study is known as the CAS Review, and its results dropped on April 10th. The review's author, former head of the Royal College of Pediatrics, Hillary Cass, concluded that modern youth gender dysphoria interventions are informed by, quote, remarkably weak evidence drawing on studies exaggerated by people on all sides of the debate to support their viewpoint, and that we have no good evidence on the long-term outcomes of interventions to manage gender-related distress. The science, it turns out, is not settled or anywhere close to it. N NHS England opted to stop routine prescriptions of puberty blockers following the review's publication, as have NHS Scotland and the Welsh government. Major American medical groups like the American Psychiatric Association, American Medical Association, and American Academy of Pediatrics, all of which endorse prescribing puberty blockers for gender dysphoric kids have yet to officially respond. American media coverage of the review, which seems to throw the entire youth gender treatment paradigm in this country into question, has been remarkably muted. Just to start us off, since you're the one who's been keeping track of this for years, could you just tell us why you think the CAS review should matter to American audiences? Yeah, well, so the short answer is, in a perfect world, it wouldn't have, uh, because we've known for a while that a lot of the evidence we have for these treatments does not meet certain basic thresholds we should want for a medical intervention given to minors, uh, and we can go more into those details. Uh, the difference here is that while countries like Sweden and Finland have done these, these one-off, important but one-off, uh, systematic reviews of the evidence, and come to the conclusion that the evidence is not there. This was a much more ambitious effort. Uh, it included uh, seven or eight systematic reviews on different subjects. It included interviews with parents and kids and clinicians and other stakeholders. It was the most ambitious effort into examining the basis for both youth gender medicine and the way it's delivered in the UK uh, ever. I mean, by I think by a wide margin. So. At this point, I think it is very hard to consider yourself pro-science, for lack of a better term, and to argue that we have good evidence for these treatments. Now, that leaves a lot of questions hanging out there, including what the what the rules should be. Um, and I, I think that bans on these treatments have elicited a huge and unhelpful backlash themselves. But uh, it seems like the answer should be somewhere between banning them and uh, assuming all is well and that we have good evidence for these treatments efficacy. I want to look at some of uh, Cass's conclusions about the science. Um, what she says is that results from five uncontrolled observational studies suggested that um, gender affirming hormones are likely to improve symptoms of gender dysphoria. Um, it may also improve depression, anxiety, quality of life, uh, suicidality, and psychosocial functioning. Um, and this is the kind of the theme of her uh, entire review, uh, this next paragraph where she says, most studies included in this review did not report comorbidities and no study reported concurrent treatments in detail. So in other words, um, the, the, there's been a lot, there have been a lot of studies of this, but they don't separate things like what else is going on psychologically with this person, or are they in counseling at the same time that they're receiving these treatments? So is it the counseling or is it the medication that's making them feel better? Um, how, how did we get here? How did we get to, uh, the point where the, the the strength of the evidence base is so confounded with all these factors. 
Yeah, I, I, you said there are a lot of studies. There, there aren't a lot of studies. I just, um, there aren't. Um, how did we get here? There's incredibly low standards in academic publishing. I mean, this has really blackpilled me on the idea of peer review at this point, just because mm -hmm. something is peer reviewed, at least in the fields I'm familiar with. I, I have no more reason to trust that than a well-written takedown on the Substack, frankly. Like, uh, frankly, it's so bad. So mm -hmm. um, we can focus on one study I know the most about, uh, Chen et al. It's a New England Journal of Medicine study. It's the biggest study yet published on youth gender medicine in the States, I believe. Big federally funded project. They did a thing called a pre-registration where you announce your research protocol, what you're going to study, how you're going to study. This is a way of sort of setting up guardrails so you can't like cherry pick basically. Um, and then they went ahead and just cherry picked completely. This is in the New England Journal of Medicine. So they said they were going to look at eight variables uh, for psychosocial outcomes for kids who go on hormones. Six of those variables disappear with no explanation in the final study. And mm. it strikes me that if they had found what they wanted to find, and these are all gender affirming clinicians with, with skin in the game, why wouldn't they have reported that? Um, so it's like a pretty big violation of why you pre-register in the first place. And it was just allowed to happen. On top of that, this is a group of about 300 kids uh, in this cohort who are pre-screened for serious suicidality. Two years later, two of those kids were dead. They had killed themselves while undergoing these treatments. That's just sort of swept under the rug, which I consider a red flag. Two out of 300 over two years is a high rate of suicide for adolescents who thankfully don't kill themselves nearly as much as they engage in suicidal ideation or non-suicidal self-harm. Um, finally, as the cast of you notes, these kids at the same time, the ones with the most severe mental problems were also getting counseling and medication. This isn't a small issue. This is like almost the whole thing. Yeah. If you notice a modest increase in a kid's mental health over two years, and many of these increases were quite modest, even if they were statistically significant, how do you know that's because of the hormones rather than medication, which often works, or therapy, which often works? Uh, I shouldn't say often, but for some people, those interventions work. Without controlling for those confounding factors, you don't know. You don't know full stop. There's no shortcut here. And this was also a problem in the Dutch research that sort of underpins all of youth gender medicine basically so no one has done studies that can add, like really answer these questions and that's a huge problem and I, I think it's frustrating because this is taxpayer funded federally funded nih endorsed research that can't really tell us anything um and involves a fair amount of hiding of data and one, one that really stood out to me from this review was this look at puberty blockers uh which we should talk about in more detail because that's where a lot of the policy action has come into play but um this is comparing a study from amsterdam of puberty blockers and a study uh in london for pu puberty blockers and so uh the ones the dark line here is amsterdam uh and when it's going in that direction uh that means that it they saw improvement in psychological functions. So in the Amsterdam study, they kind of saw all this improvement. And then in the London study, it's all, uh, you know, slightly negative. Uh, so I, it's yeah, concerning to, to see that kind of, dis, that kind of discrepancy uh, on an issue like this. Yeah. Yeah. What accounts for that? Do we have any uh, idea? I don't know. I mean, this was this was weird because this was a failed replication where they uh, on the part of the Tavistock. They're trying to replicate mm -hmm. what the Dutch found, which was some improvement with puberty blockers. And again, I, I, we should put improvement in air quotes because these these studies mm -hmm. could they were missing. There was missing data, not in a nefarious way, just kids who didn't fill out certain items. They didn't control for confounds. I don't. I one of my mistakes as a journalist was treating the Dutch research as stronger than it was back in the well, day. That was kind of like the the gold standard, right? The du yeah, what they call the Dutch protocol. Like that's what people were following. Yeah, and, yes. and what is that exactly? Sure, the Dutch protocol. Um, these were the first. Uh, this was the first team to really prescribe. The idea was for kids who are very gender dysphoric from a young age and always have been, and they have parental support, and they have a lack of other mental health problems. For this very carefully in theory selected cohort of kids will put them on blockers. Although the Dutch didn't start blockers till a significantly later age than we're doing now, which I think is an important distinction. Um, mm. The blockers will give them time to think and make sure this is what they want to do. Then they'll go on hormones. Then they'll get surgery. Uh, the results of the Dutch, even if they were good, like uh, even if these were studies were better than they are, they wouldn't necessarily apply to kids who don't meet those criteria of having been gender dysfunction since childhood, supportive families, no other mental health problems. Basically every aspect, every one of those criteria are being violated. Uh, 
in some American clinics. So the Brits tried to replicate that in the Tavistock uh, or JIDS as it's called. Um, there's a lot of like names here that I'm inevitably going to mix up. The Gender Identity Development Services, Tavistock, the Tavistock Important Trust. This is all the same system, these different terms. Um, they tried to replicate the Dutch results for puberty blockers. The results did not come back good. They, as you saw, no improvement, some, some um, worsening. Uh, actually, yeah, some worsening, mostly just no improvement. Um, yep. They basically hid those results. And at the same time they hid those results, they expanded their puberty blocker hormone. But they hid the results? Like, what do you Yeah, mean? there was they literally a court order or... to release the full results. They were supposed to release the full results and they didn't. Um, oh. So it took years for us to know. There's details about this in Hannah Barnes's book. Um, hmm. So at the same time as they failed to replicate the results, they expand the cohort of kids they give blockers to, which is just strange and not good. You could make an argument that if the idea is puberty will wreak havoc on a young trans kids or gender dysphoric kids psyche, you could make an argument that just keeping them stable um, is good enough while they decide whether to go on blockers. But that's not really the argument people have been making. People have been making the argument that these treatments improve mental health. And if that's not the case, it's much, it's more difficult and complicated to make the argument for them given the unknowns and potential side effects. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here, and please subscribe to Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed for notifications when we post new episodes every Thursday.